So welcome everybody to another interview in the series of interviews I'm doing to accompany my course, The Racial State. Uh, this week, I'm delighted to be joined by Madison Stoff. Madison is a neurodivergent, non-binary essayist, an independent musician and author from Melbourne, uh, who is writing an unapologetically leftist, feminist and queer fiction set in a continuous universe which blurs the line between experimental literature and pulp sci-fi. And the reason I'm talking to Madison today is because she's written an extremely important article that was published in the journal Overland, which relates to topics that are extremely relevant to what we are discussing um, this week on the racial state, which is the link between gender, race, and sexuality. And there's a bridge from those topics to what we discussed last week, which was whiteness, white possession, and white supremacy. And the article that Madison has authored is entitled, Why Gender Essentialism is a White Supremacist Ideology. So I thought that she was the perfect person to speak to um, to create this link between the issue of white supremacy as a structure and a culture, as we discussed last week, and the specific nature of the intersection between gender, race, and sexuality. And the reason for the publication of Madison's article was, of course, events over the last week, which saw uh, political transphobes um, hold numerous, extremely public and extremely violent, offensive events targeting the transgender community. And what became very clear in the context of these events, which are ongoing, is that while it was extremely um, encouraging to see a lot of protest against them from the community, there's also a dangerous alignment between political transphobic ideology and white supremacist raci racist uh, movements, both in Australia and worldwide. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. Thanks so much for joining me. Firstly, it'd be really good if you could just tell us a little bit about what is going on, what has been happening over the last week, but also could you set this in context of the wider um, attack on transgender people in, in Australia from your perspective? Yeah, um, basically what happened um, this weekend was there was a counter protest against um, one of the um, most recent events from the tour of UK transphobe Posey Parker, who was like someone who has been um, continually uh, associated with or seen alongside white supremacists before. And that there've been a lot of like, um, there've been counter protests about this all across the country. Like I've had um, a friend of mine, uh, Amy Sargent has attended um, a couple of them. She was uh, at the protest on the weekend. Um, and, you know, her connections to the right have been, um, talked about for quite some time, but usually she distances or downplays herself from them. And she likes to sort of be like, no, I'm, I'm just, you know, raising concerns about um, the safeguarding of women's spaces um, from potentially predatory uh, men, which is how she refers to trans women. Um, and, you know, the protest on the weekend was kind of like the first uh, time that I guess the neo-Nazi contingent of um, her supporters had made an appearance and they showed up on the steps of Parliament House in Melbourne. And um, obviously like, not only was it really scary for anyone who was there, um, but also it was a really stark reminder of, I guess the deeper allegiances between um, political transphobes and um, the radical white supremacist white right wing. Yeah. So we saw um, neo-Nazis doing Hitler salutes on yeah. steps of the town hall in Melbourne. And we also saw Posey Parker, who's this uh, UK based transphobic activist, if we want to call her that or hate speech, oh. hate speaker. I, I really try to avoid calling her an activist because I right. feel like people like her are just mostly, yeah, they, 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 they are people who have a grift. They are, they are in politics to do a thing to make money. And it's interesting actually, because a few years 
before she started being Posey Parker that everyone talks about now, she was completely the opposite end. She was talking about, you know, how she ran a kind of gender neutral household and she like let her child experiment with mm. nail polish and feminine presentations and um, yeah. So, it's, it's, so it goes to show that a lot of these people um, are not necessarily committed and there's no real social movement behind them, which yeah. is why I think it's particularly important to set in context these recent events, which had a lot of media attention mm. to the much deeper and longer history of white supremacist movements that targeted, that target in particular um, gender diverse people and the relationship between that um, and fascism, racism, and colonialism, which is what you do so well in your article. So, so I guess what I'm asking is that a lot of people would say, well, this was sort of an unfortunate incident that was perhaps blown up by the media. So how do we make the connection between this sort of hate fest over the last week, which rightly, as I said, show, you know, there was a lot of, you know, counter protest and so on, and this longer history, which is what you do in your article, really showing the link between certain forms of feminism and yeah. white supremacy. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, the the important thing to know about these um, people who uh, self-identify as feminist is that in terms of modern feminism, in terms of fourth wave feminism, mm. they're um, actually reactionaries. Like a lot of them do um, style themselves after the first wave of suffragettes mm. who, you know, are notorious, um, especially in the UK for, um, participating in white nationalist movements to sort of boost their, um, uh, I guess, personal like social status, um, you know, when that became, when they got enough social acceptance to do so. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of what's happening in this movement is that it's been, um, it's beneficial to a lot of the hierarchies and power structures that like uphold um, the white supremacist state. Like I, I go into this um, in the essay when I talk about the direct connection between um, gender essentialist views of what a woman is and um, you know how they're based around basically reproduction. Mm. Um, Cause you know, a woman has a very clear role in a white supremacist society. A woman is designed to give birth and to continue mm. the race. Mm. And um, like trans people, regardless of whether they're trans masculine or trans feminine, um, sort of throw a spanner into that because, you know, um, hormone replacement therapy uh, doesn't make you totally infertile, but it's pretty close. Mm. Um, you know, we sort of, um, we don't, similar to other people in the LGBTIQA plus community, we don't necessarily have a breeding role per se, which means mm. we don't necessarily fit into the white supremacist superstructure. So obviously it's kind of like, um, if that's what white supremacists want, um, and they do, um, they will sometimes form conditional conditional alliances with other people who are trying to encourage mm. um, gender essentialist ideas and approaches to, to femininity because mm. it it helps them achieve their wider goals and obviously it helps the um, political transphobes achieve their wider goals as well because it gives mm. them a nice black lock to stand behind and be intimidating um, mm. uh, against um, people who don't like what they have to say because it's invalidating and hateful. But I guess um, a lot of people would say, you know, that these these people, these transphobes, these political mm. transphobes, and I like that expression that you introduced to me, yeah. are, um, well, they're hate groups, but they, they pose as feminists. And I suppose the lay person would assume, well, what is the connection between being a feminist, which is in the mainstream, we think of this as being pro-women's rights, so certainly not about forcing women only to be a wife and a mother and stay at home. And yeah. that's the traditional role that white supremacist movements, as you correctly said, are very much promoting. And we mm. see the link here to the so-called trad wife movement. So this yes. idea of espousing that role of the, you know, the stereotypical 1950s housewife staying at home and having multiple children and being 
in the supportive yeah. role of her husband and the extent to which certain um you know conservative elements in um among women has you know what the vision of things that they promote but you'd say well what is the link between that and feminism which in the liberal feminist mentality is about going out into the workplace having equal rights so how can we square or how do they square it you know being feminist and standing together with people who very much promote not just violent hatred of people who are uh, racialized and gendered minorities and so on but also very much about policing the boundaries of what it means to be a woman even cisgendered white women have only a specific role under white supremacism yeah i think it's a complex question that has a couple of answers um because on one hand it's like there's what they're doing and there's what they think they're doing yeah. like what what they're doing um a lot of the time is they they render um you know sex-based rights is a social construction that they've come up with that basically says that you know because um women um often have uteruses not always but often mm -hmm. have uteruses um and often have a certain kind of anatomy that means that they have uh certain kinds of needs with regards to protection certain kinds of um like needs with regards to space with regards to privacy with regards to all of that sort of stuff but it's like um on the surface that looks valid and fine until you realize that um the way that they're determining who a woman is is basically just down to all of those same white supremacist social stereotypes mm -hmm. like um the people who usually get affected by say um the politicization of transphobia like people obviously say oh it's going to be trans women but like trans women um try to pass a cis as much as possible like mm -hmm. everyone thinks that they you know um know if they've met trans people or they've mm -hmm. seen trans people around but like the chances are you haven't yeah um it's only really that hyper like hyper vigilance around mm -hmm. um women's bodies and around things like facial hair or mm. um different kinds of um you know the looks of people's faces the looks of how tall someone is how mm. big their shoulders are how much testosterone they've had in their yes. bloodstream um but the thing is that like um a lot of different types of you know the standards for for for, for what they see as, as feminine are always the white beauty standards mm. like it leaves out the um the the fact that certain kinds of women from certain ethnic backgrounds or with certain disabilities have more facial hair than you know certain other types of women and it's, right. it's like um so it's sort of like they start from this position where they're defending something that looks like a woman's rights issue like a safeguarding right. issue right. like we need to make sure that we keep um the women and the men separate but mm -hmm. what's a woman what's a man exactly like as soon as you start drawing that out you realize that even biologically speaking it's really complicated mm -hmm. like some women can have um you know the right chromosomes but still be born without a uterus or like you know have a higher rate of testosterone than women normally have. like um the women in sports debate which is constantly um politicized yeah. um you know those 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 hormonal regulations tend to explode ex exclude a lot of um black cis women from participating as we've seen with the castor semenya case yeah exactly and it's like it's like and um you know for transphobes a lot of that is just um oh well we have to accept that because the risk of doing anything else is just too great but then again isn't it interesting that the lines of who has to suffer for that fall along with the same like historically oppressed and marginalized groups as indeed you know. and that's what what makes me think in relation to what we're studying together with my students is we're trying to talk about race not as an identity something mm. that can create identity of course but that's something that is first and foremost a technology of power for the yeah. management of human difference yeah. and drawing on what you've been saying about how transphobes try to organize um 
gendered people into very severely delineated, you know, this is looks right and this doesn't look right. And obviously there's the same logic in train here, right? It's about yeah. organizing and managing yeah. the human difference that we see before us. And so that's why it's very important, I think, for us to understand the way in which gender and race, or we would say co-constitute each other. In other words, we yeah. can't really think of these things as separate. So it's not just about, you know, people talk a lot about intersectionality, mm. but intersectionality sort of makes you think that these are sort of separate areas that then intersect, that come together yeah. at certain points and then come apart at other points but what really we're trying to point to is the way how these things are constantly producing and reproducing each other and that's why I think I don't know what you think about this but it doesn't necessarily even have to be logical because mm. you know just oh. to come back to my original question well oh. what is the link between feminism and something that looks like Nazism that would keep women in their place and be very detrimental to women but well, it doesn't necessarily have to be logical and that's yeah. what takes me to the sort of the next question that I want to ask you, which mm. is, you know, what do you think are the political ramifications of this? We've seen, um, you know, uh, Senator Lydia Thorpe um, being abused in public because she stands up for transgender people. We've yeah. seen um, transgen uh, tran political transphobes standing together with open white supremacists, leaders of extreme right party, uh, obviously yeah. Pauline Hansen. Yeah. Um, what do you think the ramifications are for this in Australia? Because of course, this also dovetailed with another event, which we saw on the streets of Southwest Sydney, where many of us live here, at least at our university, uh, where we saw a crowd of 400 people attack a very small group of pro-trans protesters. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's like multi-layered because I think it affects like on both a personal it has effects on both the personal and institutional level. Mm. Like, um, you know, most of the time that I've been out as non-binary, I pretty much just get seen as the person that I am. Yeah. It's only really up until very, very recently, like if I actually explicitly say that I'm trans and the wrong person hears me, mm. then suddenly um like I had this situation a few months back on on the train where I was talking um to my girlfriend about how to best like um safeguard this young trans girl who just came out recently and wanted to join a discord server that my friends were running it's a, mm. you know it was a safe environment for her it's mostly younger people and um it's it's not you know there's no like not safe for work content or anything like that it's yes. like yeah you know literally that was the point of the conversation we were like there's a lot of age variance here how do we yeah. um how do we make sure this person can interact with her community and stay safe um anyway this guy overheard us on the train and then started ranting about how we were pedophiles because in the process of saying that we'd also revealed that we were all trans yes and he didn't know that before he was just mm -hmm. sitting next to us on the train with mm. no problem in the world but then suddenly when he knew that we were trans he could attach this whole ideology to us and this whole like yeah image that had been placed in his head by these kind of movements as us as like fundamentally predatory people just because mm. of mm -hmm. the identity that we have and i think that in itself is very very dangerous mm. because the second you start to narrow your definition of what a woman is or what a man is to be about like physical traits, physical mm. aspects, um, you start to be able to narrow it even further. Yeah. You can be like, okay, so is a woman still a woman if I don't find her very attractive? Mm. Like, is a woman still a woman if she's disabled? Like, certainly it, we've seen this in relation to black women and black feminists have written about this for generations mm -hmm. and one of the things that we're studying together with the students this week is Patricia Hill Collins's classical and controlling images in which she talks about the way the media in the United States but I think we can see this elsewhere not not least in relation to to Lydia Thorpe I think yeah. over the last while um you know black women have been portrayed 
according to particular stereotypes, which then are used in order to police and discipline them in various ways. So, for example, angry one is used against the her angry own. is one of her controlling um, images. We also have the welfare queen. That's another. Yeah. And you know, these are all negative stereotypes. Really, but then there's direct link already. between that and government policy. So taking welfare away from people yeah. who require it, all of this kind of thing. And I think what you're showing is how you know, this works together with gender identity also. And I guess you're saying um, is being heightened because of the politics around that? Mm. Yeah, exactly. And I think as well, like the, the thing that I wanted to draw attention to earlier was that all of this has been happening to Lydia Thorpe at the same time that she's been kind of like uh, ostracized for her position on The Voice, mm. like to, to, to government, basically because she's worried like rightfully that it's just going to be performative and that it's not actually going to give indigenous people more of a like chance to speak like it's not decolonial especially not if it doesn't start with a treaty mm. and i think it's it's been interesting to see her and also really heartbreaking and horrible to see her being mistreated and like slandered in the same way for her activism like to assist the trans community as you know I think what what it shows is. what it shows I think is also that there's a lot of effort being put in from various political quarters I mean the media has a role to play here also yeah. in breaking down potential solidarities between differently marginalized groups Definitely. And that's why I think what what's so useful about what you've written is by drawing these questions of white supremacism together with political transphobia, we see the necessity to actually think about obviously the ways in which, you know, these forms of domination work differently, but also how they relate to each other and therefore why it's important to attack them from all directions, but, you know, collectively. Yeah, I do. Is there anything... Is there anything that you'd like to add before we finish up? Yeah, I, I think I just wanted to say that, like, I, I do that a lot with my essays and with mm. my fiction. I tend to, like, try to draw attention to, I guess, the things that, like, bring us together rather than the things mm. that are different. Like, I, I tend to be like, I tend to be like, you know, drawing from my, my social relationships and the sort of things that I see because, you know, no one's just trans. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. most people, most people uh, have at least one or two other additional kind of identities they can draw from when it comes to activism. And so, like, when I'm talking about trans issues, I'm also usually talking about, um, you know, class issues because I'm, I'm not wealthy. And um, I'm usually talking about uh, disability issues because I am neurodivergent. It's like... Um, I, I tend to like to like to create, I guess, more of a like holistic kind of, you know, we need to think about where everything is coming from mm. kind of approach. And that's what the essay is about as well. It's about trying Absolutely. to get people to think about where this movement of politicized transphobia is coming from, who it benefits and who it marginalizes. So. Thank you. I'm, and I'm going to link, obviously, to, to that piece and to several other pieces that you have written. I think what's also very nice about that article is that there are many links, both to other things that you've written and other important, um, you know, articles and links that people can follow up. So yeah, it's a that. really, really urgent topic. And I really want to thank you for taking the time out to speak to us about it today. And um, solidarity. Thank you.